Hello everyone. So in this uh, let's uh, in this session we will see uh, a lot about power. We will see the methodology. Uh, we will see how we can analyze power. So uh, the agenda is uh, I'll introduce the tool uh, called Power Compiler. Power Compiler is part of the Synopsis Design Compiler suite. It is used to so it's just uh, you can say that it's just a set of, set of features inside design available inside design compiler, which lets you work on the power. Uh, then we'll see the, the design flow power compiler design flow. We'll see how it fits into the uh, synopsis synthesis flow. Then uh, third, we'll see uh, what are the what how the power is modeled, what kind of different power numbers would we be interested in. And how they are calculated. We'll uh, see about. We we'll learn about switching activity. Uh, SAIF is a file format that is used to pass on that information, the switching activity information. We'll see what is switching activity. How is it used? We'll see how do we analyze power number. How do we go through the reports? Then we'll see a very impl interesting implementation. Interesting and perhaps the most useful for. Uh, for single voltage design, uh, the power compiler to operate in. And lastly, we will see uh, uh, how power is optimized in design. So, let us start with the introduction. So, power compiler is part of the synopsis design compiler family, synthesis family. Uh, it is used to perform both RTL level and gate level power optimization and gate level power analysis. Uh, why the power analysis cannot be performed in RTL, it will become very clear RTL uh, in the later slides also, but let me explain it here itself. In RTL is, uh, it does not have gates, right? RTL has uh, Verilog, so for example, Verilog RTL has always got uh, declaration of more, you know, but it does not actually have gates. And there is no concept of reporting power on RTL. You can actually analyze RTL. To reduce power, you can employ some techniques in RTL itself to reduce power, but what actually is the power number you cannot know because power numbers are gate and technology dependent. So, you need a netlist to know the power number, and that netlist should be mapped onto one of the technology that we which will contain the power numbers, right. So, logically, you could optimize power on RTL. But you can do power analysis only in this. Okay. So power compilers, various power, there are lot of power reduction techniques in power compiler. Most famous being clock gating. There is something called operand isolation, uh, multi VT leakage for power optimization is very, very, very important thing. But, uh, it's a very useful thing that is prevalent in lot of designs. And gate level power optimization again, there are some techniques. Uh, so there are there are some techniques which are very useful, very uh, uh, used extensively for single voltage design, uh, which we will see a uh, few of the techniques we will see. Then there are a very uh, there are a lot of advanced techniques which are used for multi voltage design. That means a chip will have different voltages for different sections of the chip. Uh, we won't go into that because there is a separate methodology for that, uh, separate ways of implementing that, uh, but that is outside the scope of this course. So we will be focusing on the power optimization and power analysis uh, of the single voltage design and what techniques do we employ. So the methodology uh, for so power is usually of two types. Uh, we, we divide the power into two types: leakage or static power and dynamic power. So the methodology involves uh, how do we uh, so we analyze the leakage power and power compiler helps us. To reduce the leakage power uh, by using multi VT threshold power optimization and power system. So, each of these terms, what I am discussing here, we will see uh, details of it in the later slides, in the coming upcoming slides. Then there is uh, something called dynamic power optimization, which uses uh, the ways are by inserting clock gating uh, cells. There are a lot of options available when we insert clock gating, operand isolation, gate level power optimization. Then uh, you can we can do RTL uh, level power optimization again inserting clock gating on that. We can uh, do gate level power optimization uh, by using multi VT threshold voltages. 
dynamic power optimization can be done by reading the switching activity. Uh, again, it uh, power compiler uh, gives us uh, ways to analyze power in both RTL and Git mode using simulation data as well. So don't worry if uh, some of these terms are not clear; they will become clear as we go. So the design flow is is pretty simple. In fact, uh, design flow at both RTL and Git level stage is same. Uh, there is the analysis part. Uh, so uh, the simulation is very important when we talk about power numbers because any let's say I have a design, I have an FSM, and I would write uh, so the design cycle would be like this: we would design the FSM, and we would design a test bench that will test the FSM. There will be a mission mode test bench that will uh, take this FSM through a number of test cases which mimic the real world function, right? Which will mimic the real world scenario. So, we will exercise FSM, we will give inputs in such a way that those inputs, the similar inputs are expected to be given to FSM in real world applications. So this uh, this stimulus uh, will actually determine how much power that FSM would take. So simulation is a very important part of power analysis. So because simulation gives us something called switching activity, we will we'll again see the details of it later. So simulation provides a switching activity. So we can use the switching activity for analyzing. Plus, power compiler can use the switching activity to actually also optimize the power. So at both RTL level and JT. So, uh, this is the optimization flow. Uh, it is very, very similar to a regular design compiler optimization flow. The only thing extra is power. Technology library and RTL design are tables here. So we will need that definitely. We have to just enable power optimization. We will see how we can do that. Uh, then we uh, do synthesis and power optimization. So, see, simulation here is feeding this SAF file. So, this is called switching activity file. It goes as an input. Before the synthesis takes place, so now synthesis has what it has. It has technology library. It knows the power number. It has the switching activity. So it knows. Uh, we will see what what information does the switching activity provide. And now it can do the power. It can do uh, power optimization. Then you can use some reporting to report power. Um, then we get a gate level power optimized metrics, right? But there is one more option is that uh, so this simulation is, um, is taking taking as a place at the RDA. We can again simulate this, uh, this we can apply the same stimulus to the netlist as well and get, uh, get uh, we can also get the uh, so after the design is routed we also get the capacitor information. We can feed that this information and do further accurate power analysis. Now let's uh, uh, talk about the basics of power. What is what are the power terminologies we use? What are the power? How do we calculate power numbers? So power uh, is drawn from the voltage source that is attached to the VDD of the system. So it is very clear from the first instance of the higher the VDD, the higher the power number. So P is equal to I into V. V is nothing but VDD here. The current drawn from the power supply. This is the uh, reason that most of the uh, now as the technology shrinks, as we move on to the nanometer scale, the sub deep so deep sub micron, the VDD is reducing. So earlier in 90 nanometer odd or 120 or 180 nanometer odd, the VDD went up to 1.2, 1.5. .2. But now we are in the range of 1 volt, 0.9 volt. So as we decrease VDD, obviously the power is decreasing. So for example, handheld applications like mobile phones, the chips will not hardly there will be any chips which will require more than one volt for digital portion, right? Uh, so instantaneous power is I uh, I I D D dependent on time into V D D. V D D is fixed. Energy is again integral of power D D, so integral of power uh, with respect to time. So we, we substitute the values of I and V. Average power is energy divided by time. So it's one by one by T. We just substitute the value of, of energy here. So this is the this is the average power number. Now we use this equation to calculate all 
as a power number. Now there are the power numbers are divided into two types: uh, static power and dynamic power. Again, dynamic power is divided further divided into two types: switching power and internal power. We'll see what each of these means. Static power is consumed even when the chip is switching. That means even if no activity is taking place in the chip, it consumes a bit of power. This is called standby power. Let's say, for example, uh, your mobile phone. Uh, in, in fact, mobile phone works. Uh, in fact, mobile phone, even when it's you are not doing anything, it, it is uh, the, the smartphones do a lot of tasks in the background. But let's say let's talk about the feature phones, which uh, which do not have run so many tasks in the background. Even if we uh, you are not doing anything, you are not talking to anybody, you are not listening to any radio. The the chip consumes power, right? So uh, this is called static power. That means even when the chip is in question condition. Now, what is the largest? You you already know by experience that the standby power, the standby time for feature phones is much longer. It goes into like Five days, ten days, or so on. So it is understood that static power is the the lesser known, the lesser culprit here. But the the most, the largest percentage of static power results from source to drain successful loops. And with the shrinking technology, so it depends on the the, the most the, the single most important factor here is the VT, that is the threshold voltage of the device. So, with shrinking technology, with shrinking, with with VTT going lower, the VT is also going lower. VT, these are the equations for the drain to source uh, current, uh, the the successful leakage current, and as we reduce VT, this current increases. What it means is that as we go, as the technology shrinks, the leakage power contribution is increasing. For example, uh, 45 nanometer cells will be more leaky than the 90 nanometer cells because the VT would be lower. So you can you can verify from this. So this is the VT formula: uh, VT VT naught minus theta VDS plus gamma. This is this is the uh, this part here. Uh, this part of the equation here is 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 related to the effect of the uh, the bias voltage. Uh -huh. So usually we uh, if you if you go back to the uh, equations of PMOS and NMOS, the transfer equations, you see that usually at the start of the uh, analysis, understanding we assume that VSB is zero, the body effect is zero, but uh, you could have a, a case where the the body voltage is not zero, uh, so there will be some difference between the voltage at source and voltage at body. So this takes care of that effect. Uh, this this takes care of the uh, the drain to source uh, this depends on the drain to source voltage. So, VT uh, the lower the VT, uh, so uh, the principle is that the bottom line is the lower the VT, the more leaky is the device. Why? The lower the VT, the higher is the IDS, and therefore the lower the VT, the more leaky is the device. But the device is faster. So, what it means is that the technology library guys who, who build the technology library now have options, right? They can either build a device which is fast, but then uh, by playing with the VT, but then device is also faster, but it has it consumes more power, it consumes more leakage power. Again, you can raise the VT and make the device slower, but then it will be good for low power application. So we will see uh, more of this in the coming slide. How is this useful for us? So uh, again, uh, I stress that static power. In present day, static power is, uh, or we use the term leakage power, is caused due to sub threshold source to drain sub threshold leakage. This is the leakage power is the majority component in the static power. Right. Now comes the dynamic power. Dynamic power, two types switching and internal. What is the switching power? So, dynamic power is required to charge and discharge load capacitances when the transfer switch. So, for example, look at looking at the inverter. Uh, we see that inverter it, uh, during the operation it switches from one to zero or zero to one. So one cycle uh, involves rising and a falling output. On rising output, uh, the uh, the node C gets charged up to VDD. So charge Q is equal to C VDD is required. 
when the output falls to charge same charges dump to ground. If we take a, a, a time period of T uh, and the switching frequency to be FSW, so by T, T times FSW, it, it gets repeated, right? The charging and discharging of the low power. Uh, let's see how dynamic power is calculated. So again, we take the same equation: one by T I D D V D D D T. Uh, the T is uh, T is kind of a constant here. It comes out uh, again. We rearrange the equation. Uh, we multiply it by by P F S W. Uh, so uh, you you could say that one by T uh, one by T is nothing but F S W, and uh, integral of I D D is, is comes out to be C. CVDD. So the equation now here, this is the final equation to be remembered. CVDD squared FSW. Right. Now, uh, so what does the dynamic power depend on? Dynamic power majorly depends on obviously the VDD. If VDD is lower, the dynamic power is lower. It depends on the load capacitance. The higher the load capacitance, the higher the power. And this is the most important thing FSW. This is the switching activity. More frequent a signal switches, the more frequent the gate switches, more is the power. Right? So signals, what is the signal that switches more frequently? It's the clock. What is the signal? Uh, so the switching frequency of the clock is highest. It toggles like twice per cycle. It goes to high, goes low. Again, the higher frequency clocks. Will have more switching uh, activity compared to lower frequency clock per unit of time. So high frequency clocks, that is why clock networks, high frequency clock networks consume most of the power. Right? Uh, data signals comparatively switch lower. And the switching frequency of data signal is not as high as clock. So uh, let's say the system clock frequency is there. Let the switching uh, FSW is equal to alpha f where Alpha is the activity factor. Now, if the signal is a clock, alpha is equal to one. What it means is that if the signal switches twice per cycle, alpha is equal to one. If the signal switches once per cycle, alpha is equal to one by two. Please remember this. Dynamic gates switch either zero or two times per cycle. So, average alpha we take to be uh, one by two. Uh, since uh, when a switch, a signal switches once per cycle, alpha is equal to one by two. Signal switches twice per cycle, like clock, alpha is equal to one. But dynamic gates, they either switch zero or two times. If they switch two times, alpha is equal to one. Alpha is equal to zero here. Average alpha is one by two. Static gates depend on the design, but typically default values have been seen to be alpha is equal to point one. This is only for data signals, not for clock. For clock, it's special case. Alpha is equal to one, right? Data signals uh, they typically switch less, so alpha is just a number based on some statistic. So now the dynamic power equation becomes alpha C V D D square F. So we replace F S W by alpha F. F is the clock frequency now. What happens to data signals? For for data signals, we would be concerned about the clock they are related to. For example, we write in always block, always at positive C K. We capture some data on that clock. Now that data will will actually uh, the meaningful clock is the, the same clock it, it's capturing the data on, not any other clock. Let's say you clock the design has multiple clocks. So each data signal will have a relative clock, right? The the frequency of that clock should be taken into consideration. So let's say a data signal works working on 100 megahertz. You have let's say two clocks in a design, 100 megahertz and 200 megahertz. Not all data signals will work on 200 megahertz. Some of the data signals will work on 100 megahertz, some of the data signals will work on 200 megahertz. Okay? So, data, this is why the data is also associated with a clock frequency. Second type of power, dynamic, dynamic power, is internal power. When transistors switch, uh, both NMOS and PMOS network uh, are momentarily on at once. This leads to a blip of short circuit theory. So, whenever this to the switching involved. So let's say for an inverter, let's go back to the inverter. Whenever there's a switching involved, so let's say NMOS is turned on, PMOS is off in static condition. Output is zero because NMOS is on. 
when output when when the input changes state and mos starts going from on to off condition e mos starts going from off to on condition now there is a overlap of time during which both n mos and p mos are off this leads to a burst of short circuit current the short circuit current although is less for one device but consider thousands of on or hundreds of thousands of device in a chip switching state right so for for a, a big chip this becomes significant this kind of uh, short circuit power becomes significant if the rise fall times are comparable for input and output and for faster frequency time typically this would be less than 10% of dynamic power so still the internal power is less prominent than than the power that is based on switching activity which is the switching power right so dynamic power so in terms of in present day chips the most uh, the most important factor is dynamic power which is caused by uh, switching that means charging and discharging of load capacitor second is dynamic power which is internal the short circuit power the third is the leakage power that is dependent on the uh, that depend on the substitution leakage right so these are the three major power factors so uh, so internal power is uh, again so internal power is a more generic term short circuit power is type of an internal power so internal power by definition is any power that is dissipated within the boundary of the cell inside the cell not dependent on the load capacitance right during switching uh, circuit dissipates power by charging or so in fact a complex gate will have lot of source and drain capacitance which is inside that gate not not counting the outside load capacitance right Connected to the output, so all these capacitances, internal caps are charged and discharged during switching. So this also counts as internal power. For circuits, now internal power depends a lot on the transition times. If the transition times are faster, the overlap window during which P and P network and N network are simultaneously on is shortened. But for slower transition times, you can actually draw a diagram and see. For slower transition times, this time expands. The overlap time expands. So, if you have slow transition times, it can even consume up to 30% of the total power dissipated by the which is very very significant. This is why faster transition. So, faster transition times are good for everything. Faster transition time means the delay is faster because the output delay depends on the output cap and input transition time. So, faster input transition times means Fast cell, fast I mean good delay, and they also mean less internal power, right? Uh, so uh, the short circuit power, as I told before, short circuit power is the majority component here in, in for internal power. But for more complex cells, uh, the charging and discharging of internal capacitors might also be the source of dominant source of internal power. Right? So this is an illustration for an inverter. Uh, ISC is the leakage current. Uh, sorry, I, yeah, ISC is the short circuit current. I, IK is the uh, ILK is the leakage current. Leakage current is the subthreshold drain to source leakage. Short circuit uh, current only happens during the switching. And again, there's the load capacitor. So ISW is the switching current. So there are three currents responsible of for three separate power numbers. Switching current. Again, I'll, I'll repeat again. Switching current. SW with charges and discharges the load capacitance is responsible for dynamic power switching. Short circuit current is responsible for dynamic power internal. It is caused when P and N are simultaneously on during switching for a short period of time. Leakage current depends doesn't depend on switching. Leakage current is the is the current that is. That goes from drain to source during the subthreshold phase. That means so it depends highly on VT. If VT is lower, subthreshold leakage is higher. If VT is higher, subthreshold leakage is lower. It is also called leakage power. That's why it's called leakage power or static power. So static power and leakage power are interchangeable terms. So dynamic power, you need to be uh, sure what type of power it is, either switching power or internal. 
again that remains this static power does not depend on switching dynamic the power depends on switching dynamic depends on switching static does not depend on switching static is the quiescent case this the case where the chip is not showing any activity okay. now <coughs> let us see how does a power compiler calculate leakage power a leakage power is pretty simple does not depend on any switching so what power compiler needs to do power compiler needs for each cell power compiler just needs to read the number from the so what you can do is at this point of time after this second you can go back open your standard cell library and see that every cell start with a combination cell every cell will have some power number one of the power numbers is designated as cell leakage power so that is the leakage power of that device of that cell for each such cell in your design now let's say your your design has 10000 gates combine the combination and sequential combined together for each of those 10000 gates power compiler just needs to go to the library grab the cell leakage power number and that is the total leakage power of your design so p leakage total nothing but summation of leakage power of each cell right so libraries provide single leakage power if they can provide single leakage power for all cells in the library by using the default cell leakage power attribute so a, a very uh, rudimentary a very uh, first cut library may have a default cell leakage power attribute uh, for this will apply to all the cells in the design and the same thing or or so if you go, want to go more specific which is the case which is because a, a two input and gate will have will probably have less leakage than a, a, a three input and gate for example so multi input gates will have uh, like three input gates will have probably have more leakage than two input gates because the number of devices are all in the letter so uh, so there is one default cell leakage power attribute in the library and then there is a cell leakage power attribute library uh, attribute which is per cell so per cell leakage power is denoted by cell leakage power attribute if this leakage power attribute is missing or negative it cannot be negative to the assign the value of the default so, so if for a particular cell the tool does not find a cell leakage power attribute it will look for default cell leakage power attribute if it is not available even the default number is not available it does not have any choice but to give it zero there is also something called a state dependent leakage now let's say for an and gate uh, if you go into more specifics the leakage power will be different for the four cases what are the cases the cases are the two inputs can be either 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 0 so there are four states so an and gate will probably have different powers for each of those states you can also have a state dependent cell leakage power in the library you can open your library and see if there is any state dependent leakage we will we'll probably see in the lab we will we'll go into the library and see how the power numbers are, are represented in the library so again to calculate uh, the cell leakage uh, so now what happens if there is a state dependent leakage right so uh, if you do not if you do not give any any other information to power compiler it will assume that all the states are equally probable so what it does is that it will take the average of all the states right so to calculate cell leakage power it determines the unit first of all it determines the unit based on the leakage power unit attribute then it checks for the leakage power attribute the leakage value of so for each state the leakage power is multiplied by the percentage of total simulation time at that stage now let's say you are able to tell power compiler that for example for an and gate we are able to tell power compiler that okay, one of the states is more likely to happen than other states this is called again this is the nothing but switching activity right uh, a form of switching activity where you are able to tell the tool that one of the states is more likely to happen than other other three states in that case the leakage value of each state is multiplied by the percentage of total simulation time at that state and then sum so it's a weighted average right in case no data is available it's just a simple one so uh, if the state is not defined if you define uh, the value of uh, cell leakage power is used to if a particular state is not defined the value of the cell leakage power attribute is used to obtain the contribution let's see an example so now this is a two input nand gate 
So the library will have something like this. It will have a leakage power unit. It will have a cell leakage power, and it will have a state dependent leakage power. Now here, all the states are not given. Now let's say for the total time of 600, it can be any unit, nano second or picosecond, whatever. We are able to tell to by some way that the the state A into B, that means A and B both being one, happens for 33 percent of the time. Rest of the 67 percent of the time is for other states, right? So what what is the weighted average? Weighted average is 0.33 into 0.2 because 0.2 is the leakage power when the state is A and B, and we are telling the tool at 33 percent of the time. The, the, this gate is in this state, so 0.33 into 0.2, and rest of the remaining remaining time is 0.67 into the default value. That is a cell leakage power. Right? This way, the tool calculates the leakage power for a particular gate. So again, the priority is the state dependent leakage power. If that is the option, it will take the cell, it will take the cell leakage power. If even cell leakage power is absent, it will look for the default cell leakage power. So there are three attributes: right? default cell leakage power, cell leakage power, and the state dependent leakage power. Again, please note: leakage power does not depend on the switching. It although depends on the state of the signal. So for a state dependent leakage, if the state of A and B is one, the power is different. If the state of A and B is something else, the power is different. Right? It can be state dependent, but not switching dependent. Now, uh, a very important. So, uh, I was stressing on the fact that leakage power depends on the beam, on the threshold voltage of the device. So, you could have cells with low VT, but they are faster. You could have cells that are high VT, but they are slow. So, static power dissipation has an except exponential dependence. It's not even linear. So, it's a, it has an exponential dependence on the switching frequency of the transistor voltage. In order to address the needs of the low power IC design, the technology library providers provide cells with multiple threshold voltage. So, now already we saw that, let for example, there were two input modules. Now the two input NAND gate will probably come in two or three threshold plane, right? So what we uh, what is popularly done nowadays is that there are now three threshold voltages for each cell. That means the two input NAND gate will, will be available in a low VT flavor, a standard VT flavor, and a high VT flavor. The high VT will be slowest and best suited for power. The standard VT will have a standard delay that means between high and low VT. Power is also between high and low VT. The low VT would be fastest but the least. Now, how do we use? How do we as a designer use these cells? Or how does power compiler as, a, as an EDA tool use these cells? So, what is, what is clear is that for all lower speed applications, or where the clock frequency is lower, or let us say the path is easier to meet, it is logical that we should use the home people. Why? Because even if the cells are slower, since we are working on low frequency or a lot time in path, the high VT should be able to meet the time, but it will be consuming least power, least leakage power, right? It makes sense. Again, uh, for timing critical paths, you can incrementally try and replace uh, IVT by standard VT. If the time does not, uh, if the timing does not meet, you will probably go to low VT. So, for a typical, uh, a big block, a typical uh, cell distribution should look like this. The high VT would be about, I say, 80 percent of the cell would be high VT because similar number of paths would be either easily met or order frequency one. About maybe 15 to 17 percent would be standard VT, and very few cells, maybe 3 percent, 5 percent, or even lower than that, even 1 percent would be low VT because low VT would only be used in very, very time and critical, very highly time and critical parts, right? 
so many what many people do is that uh, they will they will say that okay i will only synthesize with high bit to be best to achieve best power number i will only synthesize with high bit and since the critical paths can change after synthesis right synthesis does not have the accurate net information because the design has not been placed in routed right since synthesis does does not have the accurate power of the, the, the net number the capacitance numbers the accurate information is available only after placement of the gun so the critical paths can change after placement of the gun they do change so what i can do when the critical path i can apply is that i synthesize with high vt but i enable standard and low vt only after placement out of the gun what it does to my design is that my design is majorly high vt and only let's say real critical paths real critical path only appear after all only the real critical paths have either standard or low vt what this gives me is a design that is optimized for power and optimized for time right so there are again many many ways by which you can achieve this whatever i discussed is just one of the ways which i have been using in this industry or we would see that power compiler in fact how does power compiler do the job right power do compiler can automatically do the job for you how does it it does right we will see in the in the upcoming slides so but it is very clear that present day needs present day technology library have cells of multiple vt which will support multiple vt uh, and uh, you should use them and the tool should use them to achieve good power numbers right so this was so what we discussed in the last two slides was was the power calculation for the for the static power for the leakage power now let's look at the dynamic power or the internal power right now when computing internal power uh, this power uh, compiler so first for leakage power the attribute was the leakage power for dynamic power the attribute is called internal power that's why i have written internal power right? don't confuse it with uh, the uh, the short circuit power now this here the internal power is the attribute that uh, library is used to denote the dynamic power right so when computing internal power power analysis will use the information characterized in the logic library so uh, uh, now no this is sorry sorry uh, this internal power in fact refers to the the short circuit power within the cell we will see the the dynamic power that is based on the switching of the output load capacitor in the, in the separate slide so this internal power in fact represents the switching power but totally internal to the cell right internal to the cell but counting the capacitance that is implicitly built into the gate at the output right so uh, the output is connected to the uh, the combined range so that capacitance is also included here, right uh, plus the short circuit current so here the internal power refers to the power that is completely internal to a cell which includes the short circuit power plus the internal capacitance but not the load capacitance extra load that is applied to the not the fan out load right so when computing internal power uh, it uses the information characterized in the logic logic library the attribute is called internal power uh, the internal power table is very similar to the the timing table cell rise cell fall table uh, again for a non linear uh, the most popular model is the non linear linear delay format uh, non linear delay model nldn it is very similar to the timing table right so both are lookup table based and both can be multi dimensional so in case uh, it is one dimensional uh, the, uh, the 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 constraint input is the input transition if it's two dimensional it could be input transition and output load capacitance it can also be three dimensional it is not popular though input transition output load capacitance for two outputs that have equal and opposite logic transition like q1 q1 for a clock right q or q1 so uh, this is a lookup table so power is calculated on there are two factors one is the weighted average input transition time and there is the output load capacitance here the output load is the implicit load that is on the output of the gate not the load presented by the next right this is the internal power so it's very similar to timing uh, you can open up the library and see the internal power attribute just like it computes timing power compiler computes the power numbers for dynamic power internal case right 
again this is state and part dependent now uh, cells will often consume different amounts of internal power depending on which input comes right? so let's say let, let's say there is a complex cell in the lab the inputs are a b c and d the output is z but now when we go inside this standard cell we see that there are three levels of logic cell. this is how it's built let's say assume this is how it's built now when the input a transition three and a are affected but when input b transitions only z is affected what it means is that this a the standard cell has different power numbers for different cases so again this is state and part dependent so power compiler will choose the appropriate part dependent internal power table for an output by checking the related pin attribute so i mean it also has a related pin attribute power also has a related pin attribute so what what timing and power tables will look like for this cell for pin z for related pin a there will be a power table and a timing table again for input b there will be a time there will be a power table and a time table right which will be different in a again for d it will be different in both a and b so our compiler does not choose the worst power number now this is dependent on switching please note this this kind of power is dependent on switching assume that our compiler knows how a and b c and d are switching so whenever d switches it will take power with respect to d when a switches it will take power number from the table with for which the related pin is a right and so on right so it's always state and part dependent now let's uh, talk about the switching power uh, switching power is the power that is consumed in charging and discharging the load cap now this is not the internal power this is power that is due to the switching of the cell but switching on and off of the load capacitor connected okay? so this load what is what does this load come from this load comes from the nets right again we understand that in design compiler the net information is estimated it is not accurate so this kind of power again is an estimate because the load itself is an estimate right? so P, pc is equal to vdt square by 2 c load into tri which is the toggle rate pc is the switching power of the design toggle rate is the is the toggle rate of the net i transitions per second vdt is the supply voltage right so we saw that a signal that uh, transitions for uh, let's say once per cycle the alpha value is 1 by 2 so we we substitute the value of 1 by 2 here and we we substitute the, the the switching by the toggle rate which is transitions per second so this formula is same as the earlier formula not different so you know my p is equal to vdt square by 2 summation of so vdt is constant summation of uh, summation of p load into the toggle load so each net load into how many times it toggles we add them together multiply by vdt square by 2 this is how we get the switching power right this can be either if we are working at the pre layout stage that means we are working in a synthesis database synthesis network it will be an estimate we can also we can also use power compiler we can read the capacitance information the accurate capacitance information after the layout has been done it is called a post layout database we can also do uh, we can also this is the process is called back annotation when we read the capacitance from a separate file and uh, apply it onto so what design what 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 netlist has netlist has information on the gate and the number of nets So we can choose the post layout netlist, but now for each of those nets in the netlist, design compiler, as well power compiler, also needs to know capacitance and resistance for each of those nets. This data comes from a separate file, which is called either SPEC. The most popular format is SPEC, SPEA. This process of reading the capacitance from a from a separate file is called back annotation. Right. We will see a lot of back annotation in this file. Uh, if you don't understand it now, fine. We will we will see more details in this file. It will be clear. What I mean to say is that accurate capacitance information can be fed back into the power compiler for accurate power analysis. Right? Now we have we have been talking about switching a lot. We have been saying that switching power depends obviously on switching. 
but how do we give this information to power compiler? How does power compiler know? We give it an address, we give it a design which has 10,000 gates. How does power compiler know that what net switches how many times? What gate switches how many times? How does it know that? This information can be provided to power compiler or it can be estimated. This type of information is called switching activity, right? So the dynamic component usually accounts for a large, obviously the dynamic component is the larger part in the total power consumption as compared to the static component. Internal power of cells and transitions from logic 0 to logic 1 and vice versa will directly affect the dynamic power of the design. This toggling of logic from one value to the other is called the switching activity, right? Combined together, we call it a switching activity. Now, how is switching activity modeled? Now, there are two very important factors at play here. One is known as the static probability. So, static probability is the probability that a signal is either at a specific logic state. Now, please know that, please understand that dynamic power is both state and power dependent. So, you should first know the power compiler should first know what state the signal is in, right. This affects both dynamic power plus it also affects the leakage power, right. Uh, because leakage power again is also state dependent. So, it is expressed as a number between 0 and 1. SP1 is the static probability that a signal is at logic 1. Similarly, SP0 is a static probability that the signal is at logic 2. So, how the static probability is calculated? It is calculated as the ratio of time period for which the signal is at certain logic state related to the total simulation time. So, for example, if SP1 is 0.7, it is known that a signal is at logic 1 state 70 percent of the time. We do not know, we do not need to know that when the signal is 1. We only need to know, let us say that total simulation time is 1000 nanoseconds. We do not need to know at which point the signal went to 1 or at which point the signal went to 0. We just need to know the total amount of time the signal stays at 1, right. That is the only thing we want to know for static probability. Second important factor is known as a toggle rate. Toggle rate is a number of toggles a signal makes a net makes from 0 to 1 and 1 to 2 a net pin or a port right. Again we do not need to know when it went to 1 or when it went to 0 we just need to know the form right the number of time it transitions in a given time that is a toggle rate. So, toggle rate is usually per second basis. So, toggle rate could be another count divided by the total simulation time right. So, this the file is called the file which has this information is called SAIF set switching activity interchange format. So, the accuracy of the power calculation depends on the accuracy of switching activity. So, what is the best way to calculate switching activity? As I was saying before, for a particular design, again let us take an SSM, we will in, in all of the cases we will always have a stimulus, a test bench that is exercised at SSM for real world cases. We take such test case, we run it for let us say uh, 1000 nanosecond, 2000 nanosecond, whatever time it is suitable. We run it for that, we dump out the waveform using the VCD format, for example. And now the VCD has all the information that we need, right. A VCD, uh, let us say we are running this simulation on a gate level, right. Now, at gate level for each of the net, the VCD has information when that net travels. For each of the pin, it has the information that how much time does it stay at 1, how much time does it stay at 0. What we now have to do is just convert this simulation data into the SAIF, right. So, SAIF is an ASCII format supported by synopsis to facilitate the interchange of information between various synopsis tools. We can use the command called read SAIF to read the SAIF file. We can use the command write SAIF, write SAIF is, is not obviously when you generate SAIF from simulation data you have to read it in. The write is used for some other purpose, it is used when we use an estimates we can write out those estimates using write SAIF. Right? So, the main the main purpose is that the main uh, aim is to provide accurate and for that we need a good 
stimulus. Right? Good, good means a mission mode stimulus. A mode which is which mimics the real world app. Right? So we generate the simulation data. So the SIU generation can happen at multiple levels. First, it can happen at RT level. What is captured? Synthesis invariant element. What does synthesis invariant mean? All the registers would be captured. Right? The registers are synthesis invariant, right? Or you have used any hard coded cells, they will be captured. They are synthesis invariant. Right? Invariant means they will not change after synthesis, they will stay. All registers inside always block. Some will be optimized off obviously, but for SIF purpose we can say that they will stay, right. What is not captured? Internal nodes are not captured because there is no gate level data, right. So there are no internal nodes. Obviously uh, correlation of non-synthesis in variant element, there will be a lot of combination logic which will get optimized off, it is not captured. Glitching is not captured, right, because it does not have accurate timing information. State and part dependencies, since optimization changes the state and part dependencies, right. When we you optimize a combination logic, you will change the number of nodes and hence you will change the state and part dependencies. What is the trade off? You get a fast run time at the expense of some accuracy. So, the first level SAIF file can be generated from RDS simulation, right. It will be very fast, but it will be least accurate. The second level can be so what you could do is you can do a first pass synthesis and now you can use that gate level network to generate a more accurate SAS file. You can do a zero delay or a unit delay simulation. Now what is zero delay and unit delay simulation? I hope you will get to learn that in another course, but I just summarize here. The simulation which is done without accurate gate delays, which the, the unit delay or a zero delay assumes that each combination element has zero delay or unit delay or each sequential element has zero delay or unit delay. So it does not have an accurate delay information, it assumes a default delay for every game. This kind of simulation is again very fast compared to the accurate delay simulation, but the advantage is that what is captured is that it has all the synthesis elements right because it is a gate driven network. It has internal nodes, it has part dependencies, it has state dependencies, everything. Right. What is not captured? Some part dependency and glitching. Since all of the since the delays are not accurate, they are just zero or unit. The glitching is not captured, and obviously uh, after uh, um, I mean some part dependencies are not captured because uh, some uh, because again the delay is not accurate. Right. When the accurate delay comes into picture, uh, some transitions might change. Uh, some transitions might follow some other transitions, so there will be some some state, some part dependency which will not be captured. But but it is very very much much more accurate than RTL. But it has a significantly higher endpoint. When you go into the industry, you will see that RTL simulations will run the fastest. Gate level simulation with unit delay will run slower. For example, an RTL simulation that runs in let's say a couple of hours for a big design. Will take probably a few more hours for gate level unit delay, and for gate level with accurate delay information, it might even take a couple of days. Right? That's the so the, the time simulation time increases exponentially with the number of elements. RTL has a least number of elements. Gate delay gate level at least has a lot more elements than RTL. Again, gate level with accurate gate delay again has lot more computation to be done. Right, so. Full timing gate level, what is captured? Everything, highest accuracy. The trade off is uh, again the high runtime, right? It has a lot more runtime than RTL and gate level. So, what is the best trade off? You do first pass synthesis, you get a gate level level, you run it through simulation, get the switching activity, right? That's the best trade off. Right? So, this is the graphical, this is the flow chart. So, uh, RTL design. VCSMX is a simulation tool from Synaptics. It can dump directly dump uh, step for you, right? Or uh, you can run through simulation if you use any other tool. You can dump a, a, a format called VCD. You, if you use it, you can use a utility called VCD to SAIF 
this is again from synopsis edges it will dump a SAI file for you in any case you need a you need a design SAI file you can plug back this SAI file you can use a read SAI inside design compiler power compiler and now based on the switching activity power compiler will give you the power number it will give you the average power number you go through gate level design you synthesize it either you can do it uh, so you are since you are working at RTL uh, you will have a slightly lesser accurate SI for sound it is good for start it will give the average power numbers again you will go through synthesis you will do some power optimization maybe then you will go to a power reporting tool prime, prime time PX is nothing but again a tool which will report power for you. Uh, the stats map is a name mapping which will convert this SAIF, uh, this SAIF into since the name changes after uh, synthesis. So, this utility will map the names of RTL to gate level at least so that this new SAIF, this name change SAIF can be read inside prime time PA and you can analyze all. What we will see in this session, we will see our scope is this, this one, where we read the SAIF in design compiler, analyze power, optimize power, right. This is where we are focusing. This, this step is again very similar, this step is not too different from this step. The only thing here is that prime time TX you are using after synthesis, you can even use design compiler, power compiler after synthesis. The results are same. The engine is same. The software is same. Right. Now let's see. Uh, let's see a safe example. So this is a safe example. This is the SIF example. Uh, it tells what is the design name. Uh, design name is uh, instance is TB. Top level instance is TB. My, my be short form for test bench. It tells what tool is used to write this. Now this instance TB contains two instances BUP and B12053 something like this. For each of the nets, this file tells us that so total simulation time is 99999 nanoseconds, time scale is 1 nanosecond. Each of these nets, T0 is the amount of time that net stays at 0, T1 is the amount of time that net stays at, at logic 1, Tx is the amount of time that net stays at logically x. T C is the toggle count is you can see the toggle count of each of the net. This is toggle count is 46, this net toggle count is 0. You can also see that it stays on 0 for 0 time that is why obviously the toggle count would be 0, it never transitions to 0, it all the time it stays at 1. This net again uh, the, the T0 is 61, T1 is something, T1 is not, uh, the toggle count is again 26. Again similar for, so this instance here. Uh, it tells us again T0 T1 value again it now it tells us that it probably has inputs A and B so it tells us that condition A when A rises what is the uh, I think IG is the uh, yeah so T it tells us what is the toggle count when uh, in different conditions condition A rise IO path B condition A fall IO path B B rise B fall. So it fixes one input, it transitions other input rise and fall, and then it tells us what is the toggle count, right? Uh, so from, from this SAF file, uh, so it it will be easier to understand the SAF file if you have a corresponding, if you can take a look at the TV, but I do not have that. What you can do is you can uh, experiment on your own, you will probably know how to do gate uh, simulation or gate level simulation. Um, take a small design, take a small test bin, run it for, for let us say 100 to nanosecond, and you can dump out the, the SAI file, right. Uh, I will not have, I will probably not have this, I will not probably cover this in the lab, but it is very easy to do this. I will see if I can find out an SAI file and read that and then cover this in lab, but I am not very sure about it. So now, uh, so now this, uh, till this point, we know. What, what power numbers? What are the different types of power? The static power, the dynamic power, internal power, power switching. We know how power compiler reads this data from the the standard cell library. We also know how to give how to provide the switching activity information to power compiler. So now we have all the input data 
that we can give to the tools. Now, how do we analyze them? Right? So it's very simple. We uh, from from either gate level simulation or RTS simulation, we generate a shooting activity. We give the technology library gate level netlist. So apart over and above the setup that you do for design component for basic synthesis, you just need to have one thing, which is switching activity. Right? That's the only thing you need to have. Rest all things are same, and what we do is we just do a report power. Just like report timing or report area, we do a report power. Report power has these many options. We'll probably see a few of those in the lab. Uh, you can read again. You can read. You could read the man page. This is the report power uh, report. So uh, it tells us that what is the global operating unit? This is the VGD. It tells us what are the units. The leakage power unit is picked up directly from the library. The dynamic power unit is derived from V, C, and T units. So this now tells what is the internal power breakdown, the combination power, sequential power. It tells us what is the count. And not other power, I guess, would be hard macro power. Design does not contain any hard macro. It tells us what is the internal power and the switching power. It tells us the obviously total dynamic power is the sum of internal power and switching power. You can see that here the internal power is much more than the switching power. Right, 76 percent is the internal power. What this tells us that the cells, uh, it is probably a report just after synthesis. Obviously, the number of nets in a pre gate level design are much less. This capacitance, the real capacitance will only come after four turns, right? So, the switching power would increase in most of the cases after the layout is done. The internal power would remain same. Why? Right? Because internal power does not depend on external data. And will probably, I mean, I'm saying probably because the number of gates, the number, the lot of buffers and inverters will be inserted after layout that will cause more power. So this is the pre layout power, right? Uh, the post layout power, dynamic power, or leakage power both will go because the number of cells, number of nets both will go. Right? It also tells us what is the leakage power. Um, so you see that for this particular design, for this particular technology, the dynamic power is much more than the cell leakage power. In fact, the cell leakage power is kind of negligible, but uh, it is not so in the present technology. The leakage power is a very real threat in designs which are being done in 45 nanometer and below. It tells us the break, breakdown also, the estimated power, the, the sorry, the netless power and the estimated clock speed power. Again, clock three power can only be an estimate at this point because no layout has been done. I'm not very sure how how it is able to estimate clock three power. I think it's just calculating the power of the buffer in the clock three. There won't be so many buffers. That's why we see that it's uh, it's a lesser component okay, in terms of the total power. So, we summarize: total power is a sum of leakage power and dynamic power. Dynamic power is a sum of Net switching power and cylinder. Okay. Now, uh, a, a, a good question would be: I do not have any switching activity. I haven't done any simulation. I don't have any switching activity. What do I do? So, power compiler gets provides some default values. So, power compiler needs to only know how the inputs are switching, right? From each of those inputs. It it can know how all the internal nodes are switching, right? So it uses something called uh, P1. It assumes it's point zero one. What it means is that for each of the input, it will assume that the input stays at one only for ten percent of the time. This is the assumption. This is the default value. Obviously, you could change it. So so there are two things to switching activity. One is the static probability we are talking about, other thing is the toggle rate. So, for static probability, it assumes to be 0 0.1, 10%, static probability for the signal staying at logic level. Toggle rate, it assumes the toggle rate to be 0 0.1 into FCLQ. That means for each data signal, it assumes that the toggle rate is 0 0.1 into the clock frequency, which is specific to that network, specific to the uh, data signal. Not the maximum frequency. Although there is an option by which you can control, you can say that okay, assume that all the network at maximum frequency is so on. 
So FCK is CLK is the frequency of the input selected clock. The command to apply these things is called text switching activity. You can use this command to, to give the give some default activity values. So using the defaults for static probability and toggle rate can be reasonable for database. But it might be unacceptable for some other signals like reset or a test signal. Now reset and test enable signal they will so a signal like reset will toggle very quickly. It will toggle once or twice during the reset sequence and later it will be stable and DFF. So such kind of uh, toggle rate values might not be good for the signal. So you should be careful about some signals which might be static for a, a long amount of time or some signals which might have a, a greater activity rate. So these defaults are otherwise good for uh, maximum number of data assets. So default values, these are the variables that define the default value, power default static, so again static probability toggle rate. So the, the variable is power default static probability or static probability, power default toggle rate or toggle rate. Now you have a variable called power default toggle rate type which tells that the default is fastest clock that means by default power compiler will use the fast so you let's say you have multiple clocks in your design it will use the fastest clock as the value of CLK. You can also change this uh, by applying uh, by using this command flex switching activity you can, you can look at the man page and see and you can apply for, for each of the signal you can say that each of the input use a particular clock. So this was uh, what you do when you do not have a switching activity with you, you can apply some default switching activity and calculate the normal clock. So we are done with uh, understanding the power uh, terminologies, we know now how to provide what to provide to power compiler to analyze power, we saw the report power. Now let us come to some power optimization and right? So now, now we know how to report power, but we have to understand now how to optimize power, right. So clock gating is uh, I would say it is the most popular RTL or, or gate level power optimization. Clock gating applies to synchronous load enable register which are the group of flip flops that share the same clock. So we are talking about a group of a type of circuit which is very very frequent in your it is very popular type of circuit is it's called shift register type of circuit. It is very very popular I mean uh, your, your design will have a number of shift registers which share the same clock and same synchronous control signal that are inferred from same HD variable. By synchronous control signals, we mean it could be a synchronous load enable, synchronous set, synchronous reset, or synchronous power. Right? These types of registers that are conceptually represented by a register with a feedback loop. So they have a feedback loop in place. This feedback loop is activated on an enable signal, right? Or the enable signal, what we are talking about this, is the synchronous control signal, the loading signal, for example. If this feedback is enabled, so for some of these states, this feedback would be enabled, and the register, the whole bank of registers, will maintain the same model. What it means is that a register bank which maintains the same value cycle after cycle, the data pair is not toggling, but the clock is always toggling. It consumes unnecessary power. Clock gating saves power by eliminating the unnecessary activity on the clock associated with reloading register back. Right? Sounds complex, but it is very, very simple when we look at the figure. So let us look at a register bank. This register bank might have 10 registers, 8 registers, 16 registers, any, any number. But so it has um, it has multiple flip flops. Data out goes to a max, data in goes to a max. Whenever enable is 1, load enable, a data value is loaded here. Whenever enable is 0, this keeps on cycling with the same value, right. This enable would be generated from a control logic which is working on the same clock as the register bar. So this is a very typical circuit that is a candidate for clock data. 
you will not even realize it but this is how a lot of code there are a lot of registers like this so you have uh, you have an always block you have a reset condition or and then you will have a new condition you say if enable some enable data gets new data otherwise data does not change does not change so the if enable condition that if is this one if we end this end will probably be generated from a control logic working in the same block so a lot of rtl code is like this which results into a shift register which has a feedback mechanism to play this is a perfect candidate for problem now what the idea is that we want to for the part where it is not enabled the right? enable is zero we want to switch off this clock we want to make this clock zero we don't want toggling on this clock this will save power this will save the dynamic power not the leakage power now let's look at the modified circuit with the clock gating in place this is called latch based clock gating there is a type of clock gating which does not involve a latch so what is the what is in, in, let's before even looking at this figure let's focus on what is clock gating how we can switch off the clock so we can very popular method is and and the clock with an enable signal so clock handing it with an enable signal if the enable is zero the output will be zero if the enable is one the output will be clock so this is called and type of clock gating you can have an all type of clock gating uh, if the enable is one the output is always one where is the enable is zero the output is nothing but the clock input right? so a clock combined with an enable signal both fed into an and gate or an or gate will result into some kind of clock gate now and gate is popular for the clock the the, the type where uh, the clock the active clock edge is the the positive edge figure what it means is that if the clock is high so the enable signal should not toggle ideally the enable switch signal should not toggle when the clock is high what it means is that if the enable signal toggles when clock is high let's say it goes from 1 to 0 right the clock edge will be clipped off you do not want that so for such type of and gating without latch I mean, when you do not use a latch you can draw it on a paper you see that without using a latch the and gate and or gate both now the enable signal is free to toggle at any time right uh, so you have lot more restrictions on em the enable signal if they toggle during unnecessary time the clock edge can get clipped off we do not want that we do not want that so that is why we use a latch So for a particular type of clock gating, we use a particular type of latch. Now let's look at this figure. Now, in this case, the clocks are positive edge figure, and now we want to use an and type of gate. So this is where the gating takes place. This is the gating cell. So enable signal and clock are gated to provide an EM clock. Now the mux at the data input is removed. the enable signal instead of going to a mux goes to a latch the clock goes to a latch now let's latch is transparent as of the falling edge the latch is of the opposite polarity of the flip flop now what it what it does is that so here we have wave forms of clock and clock invert now let's say enable toggles when clock is high if enable toggles when clock is high this latch does not pass this value because this latch is closed when clock is high when clock is low this latch is transparent so enl value will get updated after clock falls some time after that so this is the trigger event for enl rising right the value of en gets passed on to en now enl is gated is handed with e with clock so now since clock is low en clock will be low next high edge comes here right this this is a trigger point what it tells us that that whenever en goes high if the clock is high there is no effect the next clock edge will be transformed 
if the latch was not there, assume the latch was not there, EN will directly go to ENM. What this will do? It will create a false edge here. It will create a half edge here. This would be the waveform, and you do not want that. You want the full width of the clock cycle of the high pulse, right? You want the full high pulse, not the half high pulse or 10 percent high pulse. It is dangerous, right? So, latch will prevent this thing from happening. So, latch this, this is the actual gating circuit, the iron gate. The latch simply makes sure that EN does not transition when clock is high, right? So that the edge is not clipped off and it provides a stable full pulse of the clock whenever there is an enable. So this circuit it does two things, first it gates of the clock when it is not enabled, it is same the functionality is same here, this data it, this register band gets the same data whenever enable is low here. This data is stable when enable is low because there is no clock. The data is stable, there is no problem here. Further, the second thing that large does is it gives us a very stable circuit to avoid glitches on the clock, right. So, large is to avoid glitch and gate is to actually gate the clock. What is the drawback? It adds one latch and one AND gate, it gets, gets, rid, gets rid of the mark. So, it adds let us say one latch extra assuming max is equivalent to AND gate in terms of area, it will add one latch per register band. So, it results into an increase in area, but gives us a lot more advantage in terms of power, right. And if you have big, bigger register band, so you have one latch per register band, if you have bigger lot of bigger register band, the area growth is negligible, but the power saving is good, right? the dynamic power saving. So, it is a very important power saving technique and in my like number of years in the industry, I have used it every single time in every one of the right. So, how do we insert this type of clock gating? Two methods, we saw the gate clock option in compile ultra, it does that. So, compile ultra minus gate clock will add clock gating, so you do not need to keep doing the RTL, right. So, uh, compile ultra minus gate clock will add this in the in the either the RTL or you can even add it in the netlist using compile ultra minus gate clock. You can read the netlist uh, already synthesizing netlist. You can say compile ultra minus gate clock and compile ultra will do that. There is one more command called insert clock gating, but it only does that at the RTL stage, right. So, the preferable command to use is compile ultra minus gate clock. All the both, both of them do the same thing, but insert clock gating cannot do it on an on an existing synthesized design, right. Now there are a lot of clock gating styles. So the, the the diagram we saw was the was the clock gating style for positive edge trigger logic, right? The cell used was latch plus an AND gate. So there are a lot of styles like that of clock gating cells. Uh, the the command to specify these styles is called set clock gating style. If we do not apply any style, these are the default settings that we will use. So these are options that go along with the set clock gating style command. Sequential set type is latch, minimum bit width for a register bank, so is 3 what it means is that any register bank which is, so it is not useful to add a clock gating for shallow register bank, that means if let us say register bank is only 2 registers right, so you will add 1 latch per 2 registers the area increase will be very significant. So, you want to exclude all registers which are less than some threshold, you can you can play with the threshold, you can play with the numbers and see how much is the clock gating percentage, how many clock gates are added, what is the area increase, you can do some experiment, but default value is 3. That means for all register banks, now that register bank should follow some guidelines, right, should have a particular kind of structure that is the feedback loop and so on, right, and an enable condition and so on. So, all such register banks which meet the criteria wider than 3, wider than including 3 will be candidate for targeting itself. Setup and let us not go into setup constraint whole constraint, we will talk about it later in this slide. 
positive edge logic is AND that means for positive edge triggered flip flop it will use an AND type of gating, for negative edge triggered logic it will use an OR type of gating. You can draw it on paper why uh, AND gate is suitable for positive edge triggered, why OR gate is suitable for negative edge triggered, right? You can it is very easy to use. Control point control signals are related to DFT uh, because you want uh, in when you want to test the design for manufacturing defects that means in scan mode all these latches should be transparent so you have a control point and a control signal name. Again observation point and observation logic depth are related to scan. Maximum fan out number of stages one sharing means that do you want to share this log gate with any other register fan it is false by default it is false. Now let us talk about integrated clock gating. What it means is that this is the most popular form of clock I mean we have discussed clock gating, but now almost all technology library vendors what they do is that they make so what they do is they will create one standard cell out of this latch plus and gate. So there will be only one standard cell internally which has a latch and an AND gate and it will have the inputs like clock, enable and output right and some inputs and outputs for scanning. This type of cell is called ICG integrated clock gating cell right that is what we are talking about here. So, how do we use that this is the most popular form of uh, inserting clock gate that means by applying an integrated clock gating cell. So, how do we do that? We say that set clock gating style. We tell so there will be multiple ICD, multiple integrated clock gating cells. One will be for positive SPG logic, one will be for negative SPG logic. So, we tell uh, design compiler that or power compiler set clock gating style. What kind of cell I want to use for positive SPG logic? What kind of cell I want to use for negative SPG logic? This is one example of this command. Set clock gating style minus positive logic integrated. This is the library name. And this is the cell name. So, we can be telling by this command by issuing this command, we are telling our compiler that for clock gating for positive S triggered logic from the library integrated, use my cell, right? For clock gating cells, also in the library, there will be multiple drives available. So, uh, you can choose any drive, and that cell will be upsized or down, uh, maybe later to solve the. DRC relations, right? So, this is the way this is the clock gating. This is the way you can use compile ultra minus gate clock to insert clock gating. Before that, before doing compile ultra minus gate clock, use the set clock gating style command to tell a design compiler that use this particular type of library cell for clock gating. You can also use a command called after synthesis. You can use a command called report clock gating. These are two different report clock gating command. One is the summary, one is the more verbose report. So, now this is a very interesting statistic that it will tell. So, it tells us that for, for this for particular design, number of gated registers are 66,000. That means, okay, this has only 4 and 2, this is only 6. Uh, let us look at a slightly more okay. This does not have a detail, but we will have uh, what we will do is in the lab, we will insert a clock the, the clock gating on a, a design and see what is the percentage of the use. In my experience, for bigger designs, I have seen about 80 percent of the registers which qualify for clock gating. What it means is that in a bigger design, it can happen that about 80 percent of the registers fall in the category of chip registers with feedback design. It is a very, very common circuit. You can you can see that. You can when you code, you won't even know it, and it will be a shift register with a with an enable pin, which controls the feedback. So uh, this is why clock gating is has become so, so popular. It gives so so much gain in terms of power saving, and the area increases not that much. So what it tells the report clock gating, it tells us what is how many number of clock gating elements is added, it added only one. Number of gated registers is four. Number of ungated registers is two. Total number of registers is six. On the, on the right hand side, the report is more verbose. It tells us that there are three clock gates, clock gating which conform to clock gating style one. What is that style? 
Sequential cell is latched, minimum bit width is 2. I am not sure what enhanced minimum bit width means. Uh, positive, this is the integrated cell that is using from the lab. Negative is logic is OR, control point is before, control signal is scan enable. It is related to DFT, let us not go into that. Number of stages is 2. These are the clock gates. So, three, it told us there are 3 clock gates, these are the 3 clock gates that is inserted. This is the summary again, very similar to the left hand side summary. So, it tells us that 100 percent of registers are gated. In the lab, we will also see, we will we'll see report clock gating, we will use compile ultra minus gate clock, we will also look at the netlist and look at the clock gating structure. It will become much more clearer then, right? if it is not clear now. We should also try this in the lab. Now, the last step. So now, now in, the, in this last session, we were focusing on the power optimization technique. So one thing you should do always is use the, the clock gating option if your library supports an integrated clock gating. Even if your library does not support an integrated clock gating, now you know that any positive has triggered logic, the clock gating cell, a good clock gating cell would be a mass that's an angle. So you can, uh, without using an integrated clock gating cell, you can tell DC that by using such clock gating style that. So, without if you are not using ICG, uh, DC will add a large and aggregate itself. So, it is not compulsory to use ICG, you can choose not to use it, and then DC will add uh, a large and an aggregate by itself to separate cells from the standard library. But first thing you should check in your library if the ICG is available, if the ICG is available, please use that. It gives a lot more advantage later in the field. Later, when you want to do anything, you want to set some special constraint, or you want to do any optimization, separate optimization. The presence of ICG will help a lot because now you have a one particular type of cell. You know that this is a cell that is used for clock gating, and you can uh, use some script, uh, some tickle scripts to extract those on those cells and do things on it. Right? So it always helps to use ICG. So the first principle: you should always look into the library and choose. And see if the ICG is available. Right? Now, uh, second, uh, now this was uh, a very particular technique, a very special technique to save dynamic power, which we can use as part of compiler. Right? Now, let's look at the other power optimization things available inside DC. We we have seen this flow where we provide libraries, netlist, and uh, optional switching activity. When I say option. I mean that you can also choose to use the set switching activity command to set the default switching activity if you do not have a for this, right. Now there are power options, we will see what these options are and now DC will perform power optimization in addition to timing and area optimization and you have a power optimized gate level network. For leakage, uh, what power compiler could do? Power compiler will for leakage also for dynamic for both it is true that power compiler will reduce power consumption on paths with positive timing slack. Enabling power optimization does not change the cost priorities of paths, it will just add one more constraint. What it tells us that power can only be optimized whenever timing slack is available. So, for critical paths with very fast clock frequencies with no positive slack it is not possible to do power optimization. Any power optimization will step will try and replace a faster cell by a slower cell and a slower cell will not help in, in case the path is critical. So, any critical path with fast frequency which will restrict power optimization right. When the target libraries are uh, when you have leakage power attributes available and when you have cells with multiple threshold voltages. Power compiler will use the library cells with appropriate threshold voltage to reduce the leakage power. For example, you have a high VT, a standard VT, and a low VT, we call it HVT, HVT, and VT. What power compiler will do? It will choose HVT cells for all the non-critical power. This will reduce the leakage power. For dynamic power optimization, it needs a switching activity. You can either provide SAIF or apply some default switching activity. Again, for for dynamic power, uh, you know that same kind of let's say for HVT cell will have uh, lower dynamic power as compared to the NVT cell. 
uh, if, if the HVT so, so it will choose uh, not even uh, not even leakage dependent uh, okay uh, leakage will become leakage dependent but there will be some cells let's say some flavor of iron gate which will be uh, which will eat up lower power lower dynamic power than compared to some other for example uh, gate which with higher capacitance at load will consume more switching power. So there are a number of gates available. You have all the switching power at, uh, information available. Now what DC will do? It will try and optimize dynamic power by using gates which have uh, low uh, load on the on the output to reduce the switching activity. What this will do is that it will slow down your power again. Right now, let's say. You have multi. Let's say you have a four input NAND gate. Now a four input NAND gate might be very good for finding when compared to multiple stages of four input NAND gate. This is three stages. So you you will compare a four input NAND gate with let's say three stages of two input NAND gate, or let's say two stages of four input NAND gate. So a four input NAND gate will probably be better in area, but it will eat up more power. So what 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 DC will try to do is it will replace that multi input gate, heavy gate, by a multi stage network. What this will do, it will make the path slower but reduce power. If it makes the path slower, this cannot be applied onto critical path right? So, uh, and it obviously, if the switching activity is accurate, it will help DC to analyze certain path dependencies in a better way. So, uh, dynamic power optimization requires switching activity, bottom line. Again, bottom line, it will only happen for non critical paths. So, how do we annotate switching activity? We say we need SAIS. And we can annotate the switching activity, or if we do not have SAIF, we can use set switching activity command to set the values, default values, right? How do we enable power optimization? Uh, for power optimization to work best, the library should support multi VT cells, especially for leakage power. Uh, yeah, so, so sorry, there are these two sides of the form. So, to enable. Uh, Leakage and dynamic power optimization. We have to use these. Uh, we can use these commands before compile. Please know before compile you have to do that. Set leakage optimization to true. Set dynamic optimization to true. By default, I am guessing they are supposed to false. What it means is that uh, by default compile will not do any power optimization unless I am you set the variables to true. Right. Uh, so this is actually the summary part. Uh, for power optimization to work best. Especially for leakage power, the library should support multi VT cells. If your library does not have any multi VT cell, if your library all all the for all the cells there is only one VT type, let's say you only have standard VT, it's not much useful for power optimization. I mean, design compiler does not have any choice, so there is no use. In fact, it's even enabling power optimization. The results will not be much different. So, to use the power of leakage power optimization, you should have multi VT cells. So, any good library. Or deep submicron technology will have cells with different VT cells. Right? I'll check if our uh, the library we are using has multi VT cells. If not, then we cannot do many things in the lab. Right? Chips for handled applications they save power. So now uh, there is a technique. Uh, this is these are very basic techniques to reduce power. That means using high VT for non-critical power using clock gating. But uh, consider a smartphone. Now, a smartphone uh, consider a chip, uh, a very complex chip that is the brain behind a smartphone. So, what 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 components it will have? It will have a basement processor. It will have an application processor. So, application processor is usually what we uh, see in the specification as denoted by quad core or dual core, smart core, and so on. So, this is the application processor. There will be again a baseband uh, which will uh, decode the test uh, the signal. The GSM signal or the CDM signal. Then there will be a lot of cores which will do different jobs. One core will do the job of video processing. It will probably have a separate GPU for that. One core will do the audio processing. One will be a touch screen controller for example. So there will be there are so many components in the smartphone is a very complex device. There are so many components doing so many different jobs. Now consider that you are talking on phone. When you are talking on phone. Your video processor part is not playing any role. So what such complex chips try to do, chips try to do is that they implement different voltage arms. What they do is different parts of the chip 
works on different voltages. Even if they are working on same voltages, they have different supply, so that one part can be switched off when not in use. This saves a lot of power. What if your video encoder or video decoder is on even when you are talking on phone? Unnecessarily power is being consumed. These types of flows are called low power design flows. Synopsis UPF is one such flow, unified power format is one such flow which, in it, which helps us in, in implementing these types of types of chip. It is a uh, this the, the understanding the explanation of this flow is outside the, the scope of this course, so I am not will not detail that, but uh, please understand that uh, I want to stress on this fact that please understand that clock gating, DK power optimization, dynamic power optimization all these techniques are basic power optimization techniques that you can use for a single voltage design right. So, whatever designs you do in the lab uh, in your lab will be single voltage design uh, you can go back to design compiler if you have the power compiler feature available to you. You can see your library you can first understand the first assignment is look at the library understand how the power numbers are represented. Second try and insert clock rating you do not have to do anything special in your RTS just use the use the set clock rating style and compile it from minus break clock these two things. Third thing uh, use the these two switches to enable the leakage and dynamic power optimization by setting the default switching activity. See the report power report. Next step would be uh, in one of your simulation what we must be doing some kind of simulation in some design in your in, in any other course dump out the VCD generate an SAIF read back the SAIF in design compiler report power do a report power you, you should do all these things to understand the concept better right thank you.